from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everybody, to yet another Rare Book Forum. It's always nice to see old friends and new visitors in half the state of Texas, apparently. Yes? <laughs> yes, hi, everyone. Um, Howdy. <laughs> thank you. Um, there's some seats up here, Jeannie and folks. There's some benches, one bench, two bench. Um, I'm going to actually ask Georgette Dorn to do the introduction, uh, and that's in part because um, this individual and his poetry has a direct connection to the Library of Congress and the Hispanic Division, and we play well with each other here at the Library of Congress, so it seemed like a, a lovely moment for us to acknowledge the Hispanic Division as well. Um, why is Bill here? This is one of the great pleasures of working in uh, an area like Rare Book and Special Collections Division, when scholars and collectors come in and begin to make use of your collections, and a dialogue begins. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we can pull out a few pieces and surprise people. Other times, we learn just to keep our mouths shut and listen to everything the person has to say. The, the latter was the case in terms of Neruda and me. So I've learned quite a bit about uh, the poetry, as well as the collecting of this individual um, uh, from this young man, and he's about to uh, share that with you first. But first, Georgette Dorn, and then we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. My, my name is Georgette Dorn. I'm the head of the Hispanic Division. And uh, the, they have been very close to the Hispanic Division since about 1943, when he first visited. Neruda was the first important poet I met in 1966 when I came to the Hispanic Division. And he was recorded by Francisco Aguilera. And afterwards, there was a luncheon for him in the uh, deputy librarian's uh, conference room. And Neruda and Stephen Spender had fought in the Civil War in Spain, and they discussed their experiences in the Civil War. Neruda's reading, which you will hear at the end of this talk, will be um, on the web in September, along with 50 other um, recordings from the, Hispanic, from the Archive of Hispanic Literature and Tape, which now has 700 authors. Bill Fish is an old friend of the library, and he's found things that I don't know yet about Neruda, which is very interesting, because Neruda and Gabriela Mistral, the other Chilean Nobel Prize winner, are kind of like the patron saints of the Hispanic division. Because my predecessor, Francisco Aguilera, was also Chilean. So Chile and Aguilera, I mean, and Neruda, and Mistral were always there. Bill Fisher is a lawyer, but his, his real profession is a collector, a very good collector of literary works. And he's really special in Neruda because he was in Chile as an exchange student. And he saw all about Neruda in Chile and about other writers, made lots of friends, and continued his interest in Chile. Bill Fisher. Thank you, Georgette, for that introduction. Thank you, Mark, for the invitation. And thank you all for coming here uh, to listen to this talk in the dead of summer uh, on a day that I might mention is three days ahead of uh, Neruda's birthday. He would have been 111 on uh, this July 12th. I've titled this, this presentation Pablo Neruda and the Heart of the Library of Congress. When Mark first uh, invited me, and I think he invited me to get me to stop talking to him, he said, you, you have too much to say. Come, come, let's say it to some other audience. He said, why don't you pull some of these rare books that uh, we've been paging for you and tell us about our collections? Do you think there'd be enough to say? And I said, well, yes, there would be plenty to say about that. But what if I focused on how those books can illuminate and illustrate his history of interaction with the Library of Congress and uh, really the deep importance of the library to him in his life, not just the library's institution, but mainly um, staff members of the library, including Francisco Pancho Aguilera, who Georgette mentioned, and notably Archibald McLeish, the librarian of Congress from 1939 to 1944. Um, when Neruda died in 1973, in the aftermath of a brutal coup in Chile, one of the first and most prominent North American voices to be raised in lament was that of Archibald McLeish. The fall 1973 issue of the American Pen Magazine paid tribute to Neruda, first with some poems by him and followed by a tribute by McLeish himself. 
Now, McLeish was certainly a high-profile uh, poet and a respected public figure, but one might ask, why was he, in particular, chosen as the person to lead, um, to lead this remembrance? The answer lies in a visit Neruda made to the Library of Congress, not in 1966, but in 1943. Neruda traveled to the United States three times during his life. The first two times he made a special, I don't think you can even call it a detour, he made a special trip to Washington, D.C. to come here and visit the library and visit staff members. Much of the focus of my talk today will be on this 1943 trip and its aftermath because it's a story that hasn't really been told before and it's really key to his relationship with the United States, both in terms of forming a very strong ally who helped him fight for freedom of uh, thought and expression, both in the United States and in Chile, and also for the translation and reception of uh, Neruda in English here in the United States, um, a really an unknown bit of history that I have illuminated by using materials here and also materials that I've collected or tried to collect and haven't found yet, is to have learned that Francisco Aguilera was directly responsible for having Neruda translated in English and appear in the first two books published here in the United States. So before talking about 1943, I'll need to give you a very brief background on Neruda. He was born in 1904 in the south of Chile for very humble circumstances, moved to Santiago in his teens, became uh, very well known with the publication of his book of love poems called 20 Love Poems and a Desperate Song. There's a first edition of the book over on the table there that you can see. But he really became well known with the publication of Residencia en la Tierra, or Residence on Earth. It was published in Santiago in 1933 we have on display here, and I'm showing on the screen, which I hope you can see, yes, the edition that was published in Spain in 1935 and really brought him to the attention of a worldwide, well, Spanish reading audience at that point. I pay a lot of attention to copyright pages and little bits of pencil information that librarians and collectors and other people put on books. This. This caught my eye because the book was processed in June 1936, which was just one month before the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, which for Neruda was really like an expulsion from paradise. He'd been in Spain for about two years uh, in the consular corps, serving first in Barcelona and then in Madrid. He got to be really good friends with uh, the highest, uh, most important Spanish poets and printers, including Manuel Alto Laguirre, who will play a key role in my talk today. And when the war broke out, and in the first, very first weeks after the war, his friend, the poet Federico Garcia Lorca, was assassinated, his world was really rocked. And not just his politics, but his poetry, if you can really talk about those in separate breaths. He wrote, as a consequence of this, uh, this war, a series of poems they were extremely partisan, celebrating the Republican cause, and uh, a lot of them are just complete invective against the, uh, the La Falange. Um, they were first published anonymously because Neruda, he was still uh, a diplomat, he was a consul, he could not break neutrality. Um, a recurring theme of my talk will be cases of Neruda giving his superiors in the diplomatic corps uh, a severe case of indigestion. One of them was the, the publication of this book, España en el Corazón, and that's where I, I borrowed the title for my talk today. España en el Corazón, Himno a las Glorias del Pueblo en la Guerra. Spain in the Heart, Hymn to the Glories of the People at War. This is the first edition, and we have it uh, displayed on the table over there. It's fairly collectible, although for a strange and perhaps unexpected reason, it has a lot of photo montages and it's recently been included in a book of collectible Latin American photo books. So now th this book is going more to photo collectors than uh, Neruda collectors, and I'll show you some of the, uh, the photographs, which are the photo montages, which are interesting. Here we have the, the traitorous generals, the generales traidores. Don't really know what to say about that one, but that's interesting.
this is the most famous image from the book, and it's, I, I hesitated about putting it in the, the show, but it's really grabbing, and it, it's, it's what was appearing in papers and being used, this type of image was being used to garner support for the Republican cause. But that is not the most interesting edition of uh, España de Corazón. Uh, typically, book collectors are always chasing after the first edition and ignore later editions, even if there's textual variants. Um, you know, there's some, some exceptions, like with Borges, who was always changing his stories, and so you might collect the second, third, or fourth edition if you can figure out the variants. But with Neruda's Spain in the Heart, he sent a copy to his friend, the Spanish poet and printer Manuel Altelaguirre, who had stayed behind in Spain. And Altelaguirre had joined the war effort uh, with the Republicans, but instead of being, well, he was sent to the trenches, but instead of being sent to the trenches with a gun, he was sent to the trenches with a printing press. And he had, uh, at first, a, a portable press, with a uh, pedal-operated press, and he got permission to publish poetry. And it was poetry that was praising the war. And to a large extent, I think this, this effort was a propaganda effort, showing, hey, we are, we are cultured. We are here in the middle of a war, not only writing poetry, but printing it and distributing it. The first book he did was by the Spanish poet Emilio Prados. It's called Cancionero Menor para los Combatientes. And I love the note. This is from the cover. Uh, this was printed on campaign, on paper that was made by soldiers of the Republic for the literary editions of the Commissariat of the Army of the East. Extremely scarce. He did 500 copies of this. The copy that LC has is outstanding. It's in perfect condition. It, it, this one never, if it was in the trenches, it immediately left by airmail and, and came here. It's even unopened, as you can see. But this is the big fish. This is, depending on your preferences on the, the metaphorical color scale, it's either the white whale or the black tulip of Neruda's, uh, Neruda's work. It's, it's tremendous. Um, this is an edition of the book that Alto Laguirre printed, not in the trenches, but in the basement of a monastery outside Barcelona. It's a, a Benedictine monastery that it had been printing books since 1499. So they had really good equipment and a really long history of printing books there. And here's a surprise. I learned about this book because he writes about it in his memoirs. He writes about visiting the Library of Congress and seeing this book displayed in a glass vitrine and hawked as one of the rarest books of the 20th century, which, you know, you, you got to give him poetic license, but even taking into account his poetic license, he's, he's not far from the truth. There are, some people say there's five known copies. I've traced about 10, and there's, there's probably some more. One is here, um, one is right there on that table, and when Neruda was here in 1943, uh, he signed it and dated it and put the place. I don't know what Mark's policy is for authors who visit the rare books and special collections and want to see their own uh, works and perhaps sign them or annotate them, but I, I'm all for it. I, I say let, let, let the authors add it. There's a wonderful prefatory note that Alto Leguerre wrote that I will uh, quickly translate. The grand poet Pablo Neruda, the deepest voice of America since Rubén Darío, as García Lorca said, lived with us during the first months of this war. Later on the sea, as if from exile, he wrote the poems of this book. The Commissariat of the Army of the East reprints them in Spain. It is soldiers, soldiers with a capital S, which has got to be intentional. This man was setting type himself and knew what he was doing. It is soldiers of the Republic who made the paper, set the text, and operated the machines. Let the poet friend receive this notice as if a dedication. I mean, I, I pulled this book. I made a pilgrimage to the LC. My first visit ever was about 10 years ago. Well, other than uh, with my, my parents as a, a kid on vacation. But my first visit with a reader's card burning a hole in my pocket 
was to see this book. And when this came out, and I, I handled it, my, my hand was, was going like this. It's a beautiful book. Um, the paper was handmade. There's a lot of, um, it, it's really taken on a mythological status. Uh, one of the stories has to do with the, the fabrication of the paper. The notice itself says it was soldiers who made the paper. Um, they had been allotted a certain amount of cotton and rag materials to use uh, to make the paper, but Neruda said, and Alto de Aguirre backs up the fact that they used um, uniforms from captured uh, soldiers uh, from the nationalist side, and they even used battle flags uh, that had been captured during the war. Now, this got me really excited, especially when I turned to page 14 of the book. I don't know if you're able to see this. Can you make out mm -hmm. anything right there? It's like stitches. So I got really excited, overexcited, as it turned out, when I saw this. And I said, wow, maybe they didn't do a, a really good job pulping the material that they had. And this could be a seam from uh, the main seam from the jeans, the, the blue overalls of a soldier, or perhaps from the captured battle flag. Uh, later, I talked to a paper specialist, and she, she quickly said, oh, no. Th this is from the wire mesh of the tray that was used to, to take the paper out, and this is wartime. And it ripped, and someone just uh, stitched it together. So that's still cool, to use a technical <laughs> word. Um, I would call that a, uh, a watermark of the war. The paper came out uh, very translucent. It's beautiful, almost a luminous paper, and I hope you, uh, you take a chance to look at it after the talk. Uh, but it's so translucent that the book was printed only on rectos. And this was a picture I was trying to show the, the waviness. It almost looks like fried pigskin on, on some of the pages. Neruda and his friends of printers packed a lot of symbolic information in colophons. This is the, the first of several cases. And um, I will say you know you're a book collector, uh, as my friend Kurt Zimmerman from Texas would agree, uh, when you turn immediately to the colophon. You, you skip the title. You don't even think about reading the book, at least not on the first pass, and you go to the colophon. This one says that there were 500 copies printed by Alta Aguirre, finished on the 7th of November, 1938, second anniversary of the defense of Madrid which the, the aerial bombardment had begun in, uh, on 7th of November 36. A lot of his other books were printed uh, on his birthday, or at least that's what the colophon says. Uh, it seems a little perhaps suspect that people can stay on deadline and get things done exactly then, but that, that's what they say. I'll point out some more cases. Um, now, the history of this particular copy is very interesting. Uh, someone was kind enough to write a, in pencil uh, on the rear of the title page that this was a gift of Rafael Sanchez Ventura. Sanchez Ventura was a history professor and an art professor from Zaragoza. Uh, by this time, he was working for the Republican government in their embassy in Paris. And uh, thanks to the good graces of Cheryl Fox this morning, who helped me go through the, uh, the Library of Congress archives over in the, the manuscript reading room, uh, I discovered correspondence relating to Sanchez Ventura's gift of this book and several other books um, to the Library of Congress. He had received a number of books that were printed by Alto Aguirre during the war, and now that the war was, was lost, this is from 1940, he wanted them preserved for posterity, and the way he saw fit to do that was to deposit them here at the Library of Congress, which was a good idea. It did preserve them. However, it took a while for, uh, for people to realize it. Um, now, initially, there was a big flurry of publicity connected with the donation of the book. It even made the annual librarian's report to Congress, and there's a full-page photograph of the title from this book that's there, and there's a paragraph uh, devoted to the text report about it. But then it was never processed. Um, Neruda taught... <laughs> Uncomfortable laughter in the back. Um, you know, don't worry. If you want to ask my wife how many boxes of unprocessed books I have stacked in the shower in my library, uh, you, you might feel better. Mm. Or ask my daughter. She can narc on me, too. So the, 
the important thing, and, and this ultimately reflects very highly on the Library of Congress, the important thing is, yes, it was preserved, it was kept safely, and when Neruda's memoirs were published after his death in 1974, recounting the story of him coming to Washington, D.C., visiting this book and having it displayed, uh, an intrepid Peruvian uh, academic named Jose Miguel Oviedo trooped over to the Library of Congress and said, I'd want to see this book. And it was not cataloged. And he said, but I know it exists. Here, here is the passage from his memoirs. And at the time, uh, Dolores Martin uh, was at the Rare Books Room. She, or, she assisted, and Dan Burney, before he went to the dark side of law, um, he, he was still at the Rare Books uh, and Special, uh, Special Collections Division. They fared the, the book out. And that's why we have this little processing key and pencil here of 1977. So after a big splash of publicity, the book went missing for uh, about 35 years and uh, then was, was refound and now has been uh, properly processed. <laughs> I will say, speaking again to the question of um, the head of a reading room's policies of books. The Neruda book was unopened as well, like the, uh, the Prados book that I showed. It is no longer unopened. Oviedo campaigned very forcefully to have, have the pages opened so he can make a facsimile of it. And apparently after a lot of um, PR work, he convinced the, uh, the librarians to open the pages. Uh, unfortunately, he was not able to obtain permission from Neruda's widow to publish a facsimile. But he was able to identify a lot of very interesting typographic differences between this edition and the first Chilean edition, including distribution of stanzas, different enjambment, and uh, wrote an article that was published in the late 70s about it. So, you know, that, that's a difficult call. As a collector, I probably would have left, left the pages unopened. But for a library that's serving the public and promoting knowledge, I can see how that call was made. Did I mention how rare this book was? and how much my, my hands trembled. <laughs> There's a, a Chilean uh, collector and scholar named Elogio Suarez who jokes that collectors, collectors have Geiger counters out looking not just for the book, but traces of where the book might have been decades before. <laughs> um, if you're pointing your Geiger counters in that direction, they should be clicking very quickly because there is a second copy of the book. It's been a little um, fancied up with a binding and nice marbled pages. Um, the book itself is not in as good condition as the first copy, but it's still really exciting. This one was donated by Neruda in 1943 to a Chilean friend of his, Daniel del Solar, who was a journalist um, at the time he was in DC working for Time Magazine. And Daniel made a princely gift. He turned around and immediately gave it to Francisco Aguilera. And this is his letter donating it to <coughs> Aguilera, and it's tipped in there. And this was acquired in 1977, just a few months after the first copy was relocated. A mystery here. The colophon is signed by Neruda and someone else. Uh, I would like to treat this as a crowdsourcing effort to help identify the, the other signature. Um, former owner might sign a book on the title page. Why would you sign the book on the colophon? There's, there's got to be a reason I suspect that the person was, uh, was involved with the production of the book. Incidentally, I will also point out um, that this is copy number five. It's written by hand. Well, all the other copies that I've seen have been machine stamped, and I have identified a copy with a machine stamp number five. So there are perhaps a few more than 500 copies out there. Um, I interpret this to have been an author's copy reserved for presentation that Neruda received and uh, gave to Del Solar. There's interesting bibliographic material tipped into the back uh, of the book. I'm not going to go into that, just to say that these are the fun surprises that await users at the Library of Congress. So I'm going to talk briefly about the two years before Neruda arrived here in 43, and then jump into that visit. Um, by 1940, he'd been assigned a plum diplomatic position uh, at, at the consulate in Mexico City. Uh, he started writing 
more political poetry, not just about Spain, but about the war effort, uh, including poems uh, about the siege of Stalingrad. Uh, this one is a lovely broadside. It's on the table over there. He, uh, he must have brought it with him when he visited in 43, and he signed it uh, to the Library of Congress. Didn't go over well in Mexico, either with his supervisors who thought that he was breaking diplomatic neutrality yet again, or the Nazi sympathizers in Mexico, of which there were, there were some, there were some everywhere. And uh, Neruda doubled down the next year by writing a new song to Stalingrad. And this one is not just a song to Stalingrad, this is a love song to Stalingrad. It's got a fantastic cover illustration by uh, Spanish exile artist Miguel Prieto of what appears to be the corpse of a Nazi soldier caught in barbed wire. He was also exploring uh, a less political side of his poetry. He began writing the cycle of poems that, uh, that became the Canto General. Initially, it was conceived as just poems about Chile. Anyone been to Chile? Can we, this is pop quiz. Who can, uh, can you name any of these geographic sites? Trick question, the one on the right, that's, uh, that's right off the coast of Antofagasta. That's oh, called La, La Portada, and, sure. and Neruda was an uh, elected senator from that section. The one on the left is the uh, Volcano Osorno from down south. What I find interesting about this is this is a privately printed chapbook uh, that I've been chasing for years and have so far only found in libraries. The subscribers or recipients, I don't think they paid for this, the subscribers are all listed on the page, and this one has Francisco Aguilera's name underlined, and it's inscribed to him in Washington. And it was apparently acquired soon after Aguilera's um, retirement from the library. That's why I photographed that date there. So, all right, enough preliminaries. Let's talk about Neruda and his visit to the United States. First of all, this morning, in the manuscript division, I learned that Neruda had been trying to come to Washington since 1942. In fact, he had proposed a two-month period of study here at the Library of Congress to learn about the history of democratic traditions in America, in addition to mix with the cultural elite and the other writers. Um, this proposal was picked up internally at the Library of Congress. Lewis Hankey received the proposal. He doesn't say who it was received from, but my guess is Pancho Aguilera, because he'd arrived at LC in 42 as specialist in Hispanic culture and had been hired by Hankey. Hankey forwarded it on to Archibald McLeish, who was a sitting librarian of Congress. McLeish was in favor, uh, but didn't have money, so he, he applied to the Commerce Department, to one of the divisions they had that was in, um, working on the war effort and inter-American cooperation. And they said, fine, but tell us about this communism thing. So, uh, so McLeish wrote down to the, uh, the, the, uh, the American embassy, North American embassy in um, Mexico City and got a report back and said, well, yeah, people call him, call him a communist, but he's really not. He's more of a fellow traveler. And, you know, in, in our humble opinion, his merits as an author uh, more than outweigh any, any besmirchment uh, that the, the communist tag might have. So go ahead and invite him, which is fair. He was not yet a member of the party. He later did officially, uh, officially join. Um, and so McLeish passed on the request. Um, the file ends there. There was a, a budget that was suggested and apparently was, was too high. Something happened. It was not approved. However, in January of 43, Neruda did manage to get invited to the United States. He was invited to an event in New York City called Noche de las Americas. Um, he read political works alongside uh, Vicente Lombardo Toledano, Mexican labor leader. And after that, he came down uh, driving to Washington. And he visited the Library of Congress. That's when he signed um, the Español de Corazón. That's when he signed and inscribed the, the broadside Canto a Stalingrado. And that's when he really became, established his friendship with Archibald McLeish. It's not surprising that they would be friends. McLeish, uh, is also a poet, uh, had also strongly supported the Republican side in Spain, uh, so much so that he came to the attention of Hoover 
and uh, he had a long battle with McCarthy and wound up with a very long FBI file. Um, but also he was a humane man who was very interested in cultural exchange and interaction between the United States and Latin America. That had been a long push here in the United States. Politically, FDR had been uh, pushing his good neighbor policy for about a decade. Um, the Pan American Union had been around for a good while, but starting in the early 30s, it had identified culture as a main focus of inter-American relations and had been publicizing authors, translating authors, doing bibliographies of Latin American works. Um, when the war broke out, it became even more important. Um, there were contests that were held for Latin American prize novels. Um, McLeish was the MC for the uh, award ceremony, the first contest that was held in the, the Waldorf Astoria. So it makes sense that he would, he would engage with Neruda. The level of engagement, however, was, was somewhat surprising. Um, first, he did some favors, tried to get jobs for Neruda's friends. Neruda was a tremendous networker, and it, it doesn't surprise me that he, he meets someone, and the next thing you know, he, he's asking for a job for another friend of his. You might think it's cheeky. Well, yeah, it's cheeky with respect to McLeish, but he, he is doing a favor on behalf of his, uh, his friend back in, in Mexico. Um, but I think they really headed off. And as we'll see, McLeish comes up again in Neruda's life several times at very key points and clearly cared about him greatly. The other interesting um, element that came out of Neruda's visit was his interaction with Francisco Aguilera, who he'd known back from, from Chile and clearly known before the, the visit in 43 because Aguilera had been a recipient of the book that was printed uh, before the trip. And this is a story about book collecting. This is the first solo book by Neruda published in English. It's selected poems by Pablo Neruda. It's poems that first appeared in a New Directions annual for 1944. And then um, James Laughlin was something of a bibliophile. And he did a lot of off prints. And so he had uh, the Peter Popper Press of Mount Vernon uh, issue a privately printed chapbook of these poems done by Angel Flores. So I learned about this from a hard copy of the National Union Catalog way back in the day when that would be your first stop to, to research. And I've been chasing it for years and I picked up little bits and pieces. And by assembling these bits and pieces, I've come to the conclusion that it was Aguilera who introduced Neruda's poetry to his translator Angel Flores and was directly responsible for not just this chapbook, which probably had limited impact, but a subsequent publication by New Directions Press in 1946 called Residence on Earth and Other Poems. So here's some of the little crumbs I followed in my research. This is the LC copy, 100 copies printed. OK, that's good. That goes to scarcity, possible value, how much I'm willing to pay, nothing more. Then this, this is the acquisition information, a gift of Francisco Aguilera. There's that Aguilera guy again. A um, little curious that it would be a gift of Aguilera and not the translator Flores or Neruda. After about 20 years of looking for the book, I found an ex-library copy. Usually we collectors turn up our noses at ex-library copies, but I thought this one might not be too bad. Um, it did turn out to be in rather horrid shape, as you could see. Um, but it was signed by Flores. And it had this interesting acquisition information. So don't worry, there is a proper deaccession stamp elsewhere in the chat book. But uh, I was interested in the accession information. This was a donation to the, uh, to the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore um, by Aguilera himself. OK, why is Aguilera donating this book uh, to other places? Um, I had noticed a statistical anomaly on OCLC there's 16 copies of this book held in institutions in the United States, um, which means there's probably more that don't participate in OCLC. And that's a very high number of institutional holdings for a book that only had 100 copies. So I figured that Aguilera probably assisted with the, the distribution and promotion of this book. And given his role here at the Library of Congress, he had a lot of contacts with other libraries. Then it gets more interesting. 
Uh, another copy came to market last year, inscribed to an unnamed Mario by Pancho. And I'm sorry for the resolution of this photograph. This came from the bookseller. It says, this copy belongs to an edition of 100 copies that Angel Flores and I jealously guard. Que Angel Flores y yo avaramente guardamos. So now you get the distinct story that this is a joint enterprise, that they are distributing it together. But then the kicker is this. Um, and I have to point out Kurt Zimmerman here in the audience. This, this is an inscription from a book in his collection. At least it's still in his collection. I've been trying to pry it loose for years. Um, we exhibited this in an exhibit we had in honor of the centenary of Neruda's birth in 2004. We held up at the de Gaulier Library. And we exhibited this because it's interesting. It's inscribed by Flores, but we didn't really know what it meant, who it was inscribed to. It says, for Peggy and Pancho, returning to them in English, the book that they gave me as a gift. So I thought, well, that's, that's tough. Peggy and Pancho, those are pretty common names. My first pilgrimage to LC after I paid homage to the copy of España in el Corazón here in the reading, Rare Books reading room, I went down to the Hispanic section and I met Georgette. We had a wonderful conversation about Neruda, Mistral, and Donoso. And I said, by the way, did Francisco Aguilera go by Pancho? And she said, yes, he did. I said, OK, next question. Was he married to a Margaret? And she said, oh, you mean Peggy? <laughs> so this, this may not hold up in a court of law, but taking all this evidence together, I am comfortable in concluding that Francisco Aguilera, here of the Library of Congress, introduced Flores to Neruda's poetry, if not to Neruda himself, inspired him to do the translation, and helped distribute it which I think is a very important role of the Library of Congress in this story. Okay, now I'm going to skip quickly through time um, so I can focus on the, the LC aspect. I see I'm running short on time. Um, after he left the Library of Congress in 43, Neruda and the US were like ships passing in the night. When he was here in 43, it was a time when the stars lined up right he was leaning towards the Soviet cause, but the Soviets were still an ally, or at least an enemy of the enemy, so it was okay to be writing love songs to, to Stalingrad. Um, but his, his commitment deepened after he left. He returned to Chile in 46, was elected to the Senate, and for uh, a series of interesting reasons that you can read about in his memoirs, uh, wound up being expelled from the Senate, had his diplomatic immunity stripped, and had to go underground in hiding. Um, you know, it may be coincidence, I don't know, that he'd written a chapbook like this about the sitting president of Chile, uh, <laughs> González Videla, uh, illustrated by uh, José Reynal, uh, a Catalan uh, artist who did a lot of famous posters during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, during that time, when he was in hiding, he wrote a marvelous poem called Des Que Despierte el Leñador that was appealing to the better angels of the United States nature, uh, appealing to the spirit of Abraham Lincoln, who was the titular rail splitter, or leñador, and also the spirit of Walt Whitman. Um, first came out in Cuba in 48. And while Neruda was on the run, there was a public letter of protest sent by United States intellectuals I found some correspondence from Archibald McLeish to the Chilean ambassador in DC from 1948 saying, you know, there's this public letter. Uh, I've refused to sign it because I don't know the particulars. Number one, I don't want to interfere in your internal politics. And number two, I don't know the particulars of why Neruda has been kicked out of the Senate and is being persecuted. But here's what he said. North American writers have been extremely sensitive to interferences with the rights of free speech and free thought by recent events in our country. A proceeding against a highly regarded writer in a neighboring country warmly admired as Chile involving these same rights would undoubtedly produce sharp repercussions here. Knowing Chile and its great democratic traditions as well as I do, I feel sure that the press reports have been exaggerated on from there. So a very interesting double defense of freedom of expression and thought not only on behalf of Neruda in Chile, where he was being persecuted, but in the United States when McCarthyism was really in full swing 
and um, you know, McLeish himself was under attack. There's a further exchange of letters with the, the Chilean ambassador to the, um, to the same effect. Um, Neruda showed up uh, as a surprise in France in 1950 uh, after his uh, underground period in, uh, in Chile. This is the copy of his Canto General that he completed while he was uh, in, in exile. There's a copy of the first edition over here. Uh, I will flip through it. This, I will have to stop and say this is beautiful. These are end papers done by Diego Rivera. These are the rear end papers done by David Alfaro Siqueiros, who Neruda helped escape to Chile after the unsuccessful first assassination uh, attempt on Trotsky, which had a, a lot of bad uh, consequences all around, including for Neruda's hopes for the Nobel Prize. Uh, they were postponed by a number of years due to uh, that incident hanging over his head. Uh, I find it interesting that in the list of subscribers at the back, there it's done country by country. Uh, and one of the countries is the Spanish Republic, which is a very nice gesture to a republic that hadn't existed for 11 years. This was a gift of Pablo Neruda, as confirmed by this, uh, this mark. So about the ship's passing in the night, Neruda was off the radar of the United States and the reading public for a good 10 or 15 years. Um, given the change in political winds. It wasn't until the 1960s that the US re-engaged. Grove Press was very key in bringing them back in print. And then in 1966, the Penn organization held an international conference in New York City and invited a bunch of writers, including Neruda. Neruda couldn't come in at the time because of the immigration laws prevented the, uh, the entrance of undesirables. Enter stage right Archibald McLeish who personally interceded with LBJ and got LBJ to waive, to make a blanket waiver of the offending provisions of the McCarran-Walter Act to allow visas to be given to all of the attendees of this conference, including Neruda. And um, I've shown a cool book that Kurt has. I'll have to show one from my collection. And here it is. This is a book that Neruda inscribed to McLeish in New York City at the reading at, for the Penn Club, um, McLeish introduced him. And I was gonna play the clip, but we're running a little late. I might play it after we finish, after the question and answer period. McLeish gave a beautiful, rousing introduction of Neruda at that event. Collectors pay attention. This is an important thing. You'll see I've been really focusing in and taking tiny pictures of scraps of information in books. They also pay more attention than auction catalogers the cataloger of this item did not notice that there was a telegram laid into the book uh, from Neruda to McLeish, which I subsequently uh, learned about. I found a newspaper account at the time saying, before Neruda left the United States, he went to California. On his last day in the country, he went to Western Union Station to write two telegrams to his dearest friends, Ar um, Arthur Miller and Archibald McLeish. And this is, this is a beautiful message. Of course, then he went on to win the Nobel Prize in 71. This looks like an ugly duckling of a book. However, it's inscribed to his, uh, one of his translators, Alistair Reed, who donated it to the Library of Congress in honor of one of his uh, speeches. Um, I'm donating a copy of Que Despierta el Leñador in honor of this speech. Um, I thought that was a nice gesture of uh, uh, Reed's. And then, you know, at the end of his life, his relations with the United States got even worse. Uh, his last book published in his lifetime was about the United States. He could no longer try to appeal to the better angels of its nature. Maybe he thought we didn't have any. He certainly didn't think Richard Nixon had any, as you can tell from uh, the title of this book. In, uh, he's created a, an interesting neologism, incitement to Nixon's side and praise of the Chilean revolution. Um, I don't want to end on a depressing note, so I will say that, um, okay, we'll have to move this. This is, this is still depressing. Um, you know, there were some, some wonderful shows of praise for Neruda after his death. There were some wonderful artworks that were made. There's one particularly beautiful one that I have on display here that was made by Colombian artists. Um, 
Mario Alcantara, Virginia Amaya. I will also say a, a positive takeaway from the story is, is the role that the Library of Congress has played in Neruda's life uh, and in making him known here in the United States and preserving his legacy. Um, if I could be allowed to rephrase part of the final sentence from his Nobel Prize speech, I would say that the Library of Congress is a splendid library which illuminates us all. Thank you. Now, I will take a, a few general questions from the crowd. After that, I've been told we have until 5 o'clock to stay here and check out the books. I will be here till 5 on the dot. I will answer any questions you might have, um, or you could run away, uh, as you wish. Um, questions? So we'll entertain a few questions from the crowd, and then I've told them that after that, we'll have the room available until 5 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Ma making sure he didn't cut me back to 4.30. Yes? How did um, the World War II affect operations here at the library? You know, you that, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, so the library, well, number one, the library, as it was receiving things to be safeguarded here, like the Magna Carta from Britain, uh, some things from Republican Spain, it was sending off some of its treasures to the fort, not Fort Meade up the street, but would you believe Fort Knox? Uh, so a lot of the key materials from the library were being shipped elsewhere. Um, McLeish himself saw the library as a beacon of freedom. Uh, he interpreted his mandate as Librarian of Congress to, um, to really work with the war effort to engage the other countries that were either uh, already allies or could become stronger allies uh, through mutual understanding. Uh, I'm sure there's people in this room that could answer your question even better, starting with the archivist of the Library of Congress. Cheryl, please. Yeah, well, in a very anecdotal way, it did affect his visit. Uh, Georgette recounted to me an anecdote uh, that Neruda said when he was here in 66, he was reminiscing about his visit. Oh, I, I skipped his visit in, in 66. After the New York City, he came to Washington, D.C. Uh, at the invitation of Stephen Spender, uh, who was the poetry consultant, a.k.a. Li librarian of, uh, poet laureate at the Library of Congress and they reminisced about the 43 trip. He apparently had a flat tire on the way down from New York City, and during wartime, it's rather difficult to replace a flat tire. So somehow he managed to get back to New York City. Um, so I, I can only offer that, that anecdote about how the war affected him here. Yes? I just wondered what language did McLeish and Neruda use? Did McLeish speak Spanish, or were they always speaking in English? Well, tell you what. I will, I will play you a clip. As I leave, I will play a clip of McLeish introducing Neruda. You'll probably determine that he didn't speak Spanish. <laughs> ba ba based he understood Spanish. He understood Spanish. He okay, good. Spanish. His, I doubt he spoke it. Uh, Neruda could speak English. Um, his French was far better. He, he'd, been, he'd studied to be a French teacher in Chile and, of course, was the ambassador in France. But his, his English was decent. Neruda thought of him as a poet. <laughs> McLeish won the Pulitzer Prize three times. Now, at least one of those was for a play, but, but, his, yes, but his first Pulitzer Prize was for Conquistador, an epic poem about the discovery and conquest of America, translated by Francisco Aguilera later on, note to self. <laughs> Not a bad idea to translate a book of poetry by your boss. That was a good <laughs> career move. Um, <laughs> And Neruda refers to him, in fact, in that uh, New York City presentation in 1966, he calls him the great poet McLeish. And if we go back to the inscribed copy, no, that just says his, his old friend. It doesn't call him poet. But I, I think he saw him as a poet. 
you know, in terms of being able to ask favors from him, he probably saw him as a, states, as a statesman and a person with good political pull and reputation. And was the 66 meeting the one where Graham Greene was also involved? No. No. Greene was here in the 70s. But he might have been he in New York City because... Yes, he was. It, it was a big event in New York City in 66 with a lot of writers who had previously had trouble getting in the United States. Uh, I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if Green. I don't know if Green was one of them. In fact, it was McNish who decided to start the archive because uh, the archive of Hispanic literature on tape. Yeah. That's interesting because. I, that it was by, by Uh huh. I knew that McLeish had liked Aguilera's translation so much that he had Aguilera record it and the, the acetate master is, is held here and I wondered if that wasn't perhaps incentive for Aguilera to go down that path with other with Latin American poets or perhaps to know that he had support from up top for that type of enterprise. Uh -huh. English poets, American poets, English poets, English that's not been its problem, you know. And then Latin American was the first uh, and the library poet form for very good. One more question, then we'll adjourn and look at books. I have one. Mark. Um, you, will, uh, you have a few books left, and then you're done. What's your next collection? <laughs> well, you know, I think I'm going to have to wait. I don't know how you answer that with your wife. And your All right, well, I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking strategically. Um, <laughs> I may have to wait for one or both of my children to go to college to have some, some extra linear feet come, come free. Um, do not turn your room into books. Uh, I will say I, I collect heavily uh, Ediciones Vigia. In fact, that, my introduction to LC was through Jeannie Drews. I sent her a fan email out of the blue right as, he, as she was joining LC. Um, and she just gave a great talk about it a while ago. Yeah. It just I collect Spanish language imprints from San Antonio, from the teens through on, uh, from the waves of uh, immigrants from the Mexican Revolution. Um, I don't know. You have a couple questions brewing then, is that it? Yes. Yes. All righty, well thank you all very much for your attention. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.